The deeper a sound's frequency, the farther it will carry through the world. The maturity and wisdom of a leader follows the same principle. The deeper it is, the farther it will carry. This is true of the president and CEO of the Society for Human Resource Management, Johnny C. Taylor Jr. As CEO of the largest HR professional society in the world, Johnny C. Taylor Jr.'s leadership of over 300,000 members ultimately affects the lives of 110 million people in more than 165 different countries. Prior to his current role, Johnny C. Taylor Jr. earned his Doctor of Jurisprudence at Drake University, served in senior leadership at both IAC Interactive Corp and Viacom's Paramount Pictures, and was also CEO of the Thurgood Marshall College Fund, which advocates and represents publicly supported historically black colleges and universities. In addition to writing a weekly column for USA Today entitled Ask HR, Johnny C. Taylor Jr. frequently testifies before Congress on critical workforce issues. In 2021, he was named the ALA Professional Society CEO of the Year by CEO Update, and his book Reset, A Leader's Guide to Work in an Age of Upheaval was a national bestseller. Please welcome Johnny C. Taylor Jr. I want to talk with you about an issue that is near and dear to my heart, an issue of great relevance to the world of work and to every one of you. It's frankly one of the most pertinent, I would argue, most pertinent issue facing our world. This is a global issue, and that is empathy. We have a real empathy problem, and I want to spend some time talking about it. Now, you may be asking yourself, why is this HR guy, you all just saw the introduction, why is he talking about empathy? Shouldn't he be here talking, us, talking to us and lecturing us about the great resignation, right? The hybrid work, wage inflation, or any of the other pressing and burning workplace issues of the day. Well, let me share with you a little story that'll shed some light on who this HR guy is. You see, like Sahar, I'm actually a CEO, and I'm a recovering lawyer, <laughs> right? We work on it real hard, ladies and gentlemen. Um, but I spent the beginning of my law career, right, litigating complex commercial litigation cases and, and practicing global labor and employment law. But one day, just one day I remember, and I remember it so vividly as if, I, as if it were yesterday, I sat in my office and I said, you know what? All I do every day is constantly put out fires. I'm fixing problems as opposed to getting in the front of them. I'm, I'm getting rid of people instead of thinking about how to make them better so that we can keep them. I'm not thinking in my legal practice about how to make the world of work work for everyone. No, I'm thinking about how to keep us off of the front page of a newspaper or out of a courtroom. That's it. That was my job, ladies and gentlemen. It was what I did well. It was what they paid me to, a lot of money to do, but it wasn't who I was. And it surely wasn't how I saw myself spending the next 30 to 45 years in my career. So I decided that day, it's one of those moments, we all have those moments right in our lives that you remember, I was going to make a change. While I loved being a lawyer, I really did. I realized that I could be far more effective for my employer and the employees in a strategic role in HR, human resources. The difference for me is it was human resources. I was gonna focus on the human side of all of this. I began preparing myself for a career change. I didn't know what I was gonna do, because remember, I'm in the law department, and one day I was blessed for all of this to come to fruition. What happened? I'm sitting in my office at Blockbuster, Yes, there once was a company called Blockbuster, ladies and gentlemen. Across the globe, you had to get up. I was telling my 12-year-old daughter the other day, I said, yeah, you used to have to get up and make it a Blockbuster night. She's like, what? I said, little girl. I said, we don't even go to movie theaters, Daddy. That's so lame. I was like, well, that's what we did back in the dark ages. Anyway, there once was something called a Blockbuster. I'm sitting in my office, and I got a call from the principal. In this context, it was the CEO. And he said, Johnny, we have a great opportunity. We've watched you. We know what you're about, we know what your heart is, we'd like you to take over the role as the VP of HR. My friends, I was shocked, I was honored, because I'd been preparing for it, I'd prayed for it, and this is what I knew I wanted, but I didn't know how it would happen. Again, God made it happen. 
And so I did what many of us do. You immediately call the person who, who just impacts your life in so many ways. For me, I love my mother and my father, but at the end of the day, it's my grandma. I'm a grandma's boy. So I called grandma. I said, grandma, I got great news. She said, what? because I knew what she was going to do, go to the bridge club and tell all of her friends. She just wanted to brag about what her boy was doing. So I said, I got great news. I just got a promotion. I'm about to be the vice president of human resources for Blockbuster Entertainment. There was silence on the end of the phone. I said, oh God, I killed my grandma. She's so excited about this. She fell out, gave her a heart attack. Lord Jesus. Well, after about eight to 10 seconds, she revived, <laughs> and she was like, why would you go do that? Why would you go leave a real profession, the law, and go be an HR person? My friend, she hurt my feelings. <laughs> I was crushed, and I'm not exaggerating. I was like, really, Granny? Like, okay. So let me tell you what happened. From that day and for the next 25 years, I've committed myself, my life, my body of work to showing Granny and the rest of the world a vision of what HR could be. Not what you see on television every day on The Office or wherever you are around the world, but a profession. <laughs> I saw you all. <laughs> Let me get through my material. All right, stop this. Okay. But that we could be a profession with a unique transformational power to do good. And not just to do good financially for the organizations that we service, but, but for others to actually do good in the world, to transform people's lives. Because unless you're sort of a trust fund baby, at the end of the day, all of us have to go to work, right? So we've got to figure out how to make this work for everyone, mutual benefit. So first couple of weeks of my job in HR, I'm now the VP of HR, I've got the big office, the big title, I showed my grandma my big paycheck, right? And I asked myself, why is everyone in this company so unhappy, right? Why are they so angry? And I know right now, we often like, right? Everybody seems mad about something. And it became really clear to me, even back in the 1990s, that there was a rise of apathy and a decline of empathy. And that we were, it was gonna create a real problem for our society, one that we needed to address as leaders before we lost it all. So let's talk about apathy. Big issue that I want to confront up front. Just the other day, I was reading a story in the UK papers about the heart-wrenching details of a 58-year-old woman named Sheila. Sheila died in her London apartment in August of 2019. That will happen to all of us at some point. We're going to come to the end of this journey, right? But that's not the tragedy per se. The tragedy was that her body was not discovered until this past February. February of 2022, yes, two and a half years after she died. She had literally disappeared without going anywhere. You see, despite the stacked unopened mail in the apartment building hallway, and get ready, the smell of decomposing body coming out of her flat, no one made a point of getting inside that apartment to check on her. Two and a half years. In fact, neither Sheila's landlord nor the housing association ever thought to check on her. Even after a neighbor reported maggots and flies coming from her apartment. This is a real story. Unbelievably, they had text messages that they uncovered during the investigation of her death, and those text messages reveal that the landlord literally responded to one of her neighbor's complaints about the smell and, fat and maggots, and he said, our pest control doesn't deal with maggots. That's her problem. This is right now in 2022, my friends. This is where we've come, and it is very, very bad. As described by a news report, she was simply forgotten. Ultimately, law enforcement officials admitted everyone simply failed to join the dots. That's their language. Failed to join the dots. What? No. This was full apathy on display. A society, mankind, at its worst. Now, as heartbreaking 
as this story is. The fact of the matter is that there are many more Sheilas amongst us right now at work. We see them every day, but we don't see them in malls, even in our churches, perhaps in this audience today. These are the people who live life unseen, unheard, unconnected to their fellow man or woman. There's one other very troubling observation that I'm, I'm noticing, and I think many of you around the globe must be seeing. Tragic and otherwise, the COVID-19 pandemic exposed a major issue that has spread around the globe like a virus. People have lost faith in our oldest institutions. Our public trust, no matter where you are, is broken. And it's not simply because of the black swan events of the past two years, we know them all. We've been on this journey for some time, we really have. We are now unwilling to work collectively to make our communities better. People are fighting in airports and attacking hospital staff, the people who are there to help you, and first responders. You're attacking them. The news has become little more than political shouting matches, right? Witnesses use their phones not to help you, but to record your tragedy for social media. This is where we are. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a deep, cultural problem. One I would argue, as I said earlier, is the biggest thing facing us globally. We have an empathy deficit for a lot of reasons we can point to. Sharp political divisions, the isolation made easy by technology, the deterioration of civility. We have given up on understanding the hearts of our fellow human beings. We've collectively lost the ability to look through others' eyes, to walk in their shoes. And I often ask myself, and today I ask you, how did we arrive at this empathy gap, this really disgusting deficit? We have, in the United States, we've set up these permanent rivalries, me versus you. And by the way, that's across the globe. We're increasingly tribal as a society, and we live in a world of separate identities. Listen, and I say this often, we are as diverse as we've ever been and at once as divided as we've ever been. In the U.S., if it's not red versus blue, around the globe it's men versus women, urban versus rural, black versus white versus brown versus yellow, immigrant or native, blue collar versus white collar or pink collar, millennial versus baby boomer versus Generation Z. Even more sinister, Underlying this divide are messages like, if you aren't with me, you're against me. I'm right, so that makes you wrong. You're not like me, so I don't like you. Someone like you hurt me, so I'm going to hurt you back. You see, this lack of empathy is widespread because lacking empathy is extremely easy these days. It takes no thought and it takes no sacrifice to reject or invalidate someone else. And much of it can be done quite handily on the anonymous internet. Look at the media we consume. It has become so fragmented, we can actually curate exactly the right messages that make us feel good or make us feel aggrieved, depending upon what entertains us on that day. We don't even have to know what the other side is, their experience is, their opinion is, because as long as it's different, it's fair game. And this empathy deficit shows up every day in our communities, in our workplaces, in our families increasingly, and even in our churches. But deep down, don't we all really want the same thing? Don't we, to make a decent living, to take care of our families, to enjoy personal freedom, to pursue happiness? The problem is each of us want to do it in our own way. You see, although we have the same goals, we aren't unified by them. We have been conditioned to think only of ourselves, which is the polar opposite of empathy. Society is now all about the individual. We've become a have it your way culture, right? And we've created this, and now it's expected by the newest, younger generations. And we seem to therefore feel the need to continue to feed this very divisive and counterproductive approach. 
But once upon a time, societies and, and politics did not celebrate the individual above all. We were grounded in the notion of a common good and collective responsibility. It was that search, that search for commonality that enabled early humans to survive as a species when isolation meant death and extinction. The fact of the matter is, as humans, we want to know and understand each other. It's about security. And that's why empathy is not necessarily something we need to teach or learn. It's inherent in human nature. So it's more like something we need to exercise a little bit more. Empathy is a muscle we all have, but we need to strengthen it because it has atrophied. It really has. And it's our collective, each of us in the world, if you're looking at this online, in this room, if you're here with us, it is our responsibility to strengthen empathy in our societies, to close the empathy gap, to reverse the deficit. So, I hope by now you're asking yourself, what can I, as a leader, what can I do, what can we collectively do as leaders to infuse empathy into our culture, both in our work, our communities, across the globe? Many of you have asked me, what's the difference between sympathy and empathy? That's another speech, I'll give that to you later, but <laughs> how do I manage my organization? Some have asked you, charging leaders. How can I hold people accountable while being empathetic, that feels soft? Well, let me tell you, there's a different way. I'm gonna share a story of a real employee whose name is Pat to answer that question. So it illustrates what each of us can do, one person, one leader at a time. Once a superstar, Pat's performance has steadily and uncharacteristically declined over the past year. We all know a Pat. We know something is wrong with Pat, but when you ask Pat, Pat says, I'm fine, I'm okay, leave me alone. I'll get your work done. We know Pat works for a fair, but potentially demanding people manager, some of you in this room, right? But Pat's always been productive, always met deadlines and, and produced high quality work. So what's going on? I just don't understand. I just as soon fire Pat, put her on a, you know, those plans, the PIP plans, and get rid of Pat because she's not performing. But here's what you didn't know, and if you asked, you would. Pat is going through an acrimonious divorce. Pat's kids are failing school because they too are dealing with seeing their household fall apart. Oh yeah, Pat's spouse has moved out and refused to provide any financial support. So Pat's now financing the whole house on one salary. Meanwhile, Pat, like many of us, is part of what we call the sandwich generation. Pat's dependents include a set of teenagers, but also 70-year-old parents. And if all of this was not enough, while at work one day, Pat's mom called and shared that she'd been just diagnosed with an aggressive form of breast cancer. As a result of all of this, and more, Pat's quickly falling into a deep depression. And not surprisingly, Pat's performance at work is also falling apart. Pat's life has become a life without margin. There's just no room for her or him to move. By the way, Pat could be a man or a woman, I'm not gonna tell you. Overwhelmed, under the gun, Pat is literally up against the wall. The question I'd ask any of you across the globe as you're listening and learning, how many Pats do you have? How many of you have actually surveyed your workplace, your church, your community, and asked, how many Pats do I know? We all have a breaking point, even the strongest of us. So despite the expectations we heap on each other, we are all human. Remember I told you I got into this because I was going to get into human resources. As leaders, we are positioned. We're actually positioned. God put us in these positions to help all the pats on our team by leaning into and focusing on our empathy. Ask the questions of the pats and truly listen, not for judgment or to find a solution always, but to understand. Sometimes people just want to be heard. Sometimes the most important thing you can do for people is to try to understand what they are experiencing. We call that empathy. 
Knowing someone comprehends the, the depths of our challenges helps us to feel and know that we're not alone. Now, once you establish a baseline of understanding and trust, and all of us can do this, only then are you able to work together to find a way forward. But you must first understand who your pets are and what their realities are. And that, my friends, takes empathy. Global leaders, we must lead. The word leader is more than a word. It's an action, it's a verb, right? As leaders, we must start with ourselves. We must lead from the front of the parade, right? This is true whether you're the leader of a global enterprise, a community outreach program, or a thriving ministry at your church. The people in your organizations need us. They look to us to serve as the standard for how to act. As leaders, we must practice empathy daily, not every once in a while when you're reminded about a pat in your environment. We cannot just talk about it. We must live it. We must demonstrate it. They're going to hold us accountable. So how do we get there? How do we as leaders live out the biblical challenge to honor everyone and outdo everyone in showing honor? How do we do that? Let me suggest three steps that may seem small but can leave a big footprint. Number one, engage in discussions, not debates. Our goal in having discussions with people should be to learn about them, learn from each other, not assert our own perspectives. Getting in the last word or frankly winning an argument because in that instance, everyone loses, even if you feel good when you leave. Be an extreme listener, not listening to respond, but to understand. I, my grandmother would always tell me, we're born with two ears and just one mouth. You get the point? Okay, so we were created to be quick to listen and slow to speak. Great leaders listen extremely well with their eyes as well as their ears. In this era where emailing, texting, and posting have virtually like replaced talking, if you've ever been in a car with kids, they're all in the back seat, no one's talking, but they're all communicating, it's weird, right? Um, we must be present and observe each other to hear what others are saying as well as what they are not saying. Number two, we need you to embrace diversity. We must start with recognizing that we, human beings, have a lot more in common than we are that we have different. Once we understand that we are a lot more common, me and this gentleman, me and that young lady have a lot more in common as human beings, then we have somewhere to work from. We should celebrate, not denigrate our differences. And I'm not limiting diversity simply to the traditional notions of race, gender, age. I'm also talking about diversity in its broadest sense, diversity of background, diversity of personalities, and yes, diversity of opinion and perspective. Receiving people with honor does not automatically equate to condoning their opinions. Look and listen through a lens of empathy. And every time you hear someone say something that doesn't quite sit right with you, stop, something you don't understand and that's different than sort of your experience, your worldview. Step back a little, right? Instead of judging, which we are all tempted to do, ask yourself, I wonder why that person said that. Why do they feel that? What led them to this point? I'm suggesting that before we tell others how to behave, we hold up the mirror, right, and look at ourselves. The more we do this, the more credibility we will gain with our employees, with our community members, with others, and we will get this right. This is the only way we're gonna collectively strengthen our empathy muscles. You must meet people where they are and understand how they get there and how they got there before you can help them go where they need to be. Lastly, and this is so important, I just wrote a statement to about 315,000 people. I said, we have got to be kinder as human beings. We've got to be kinder. We've got to take the random out of random acts of kindness. Kindness needs not be grandiose, showy, or even flamboyant. Often it's the seemingly ordinary acts of, comp of just ordinary people. That's what it's really, and that stands out. Can we all acknowledge that kindness is in short supply these days? We're in a really not good place. 
The most memorable acts of kindness come wrapped in small packages, uh, tied together with the attitude of gratitude, handwritten notes. People don't do that anymore, right? Opening doors. I don't care if it's a man or woman. Open the door if you see someone coming, right? Let people see that you see them. And kindness is contagious, better caught than taught. In fact, the thought always outweighs the act. Kindness has an immeasurable ROI. Recipients of kindness don't simply see a thank you on your door or they don't see you opening an elevator door. They see that you see them, that you truly see them. Okay, so when we see people's humanity as I wrap this up, we treat each other's with civility, the respect, and yes, the love they and the world needs so desperately. And it all begins with intentionally practicing empathy in every relationship and every collective endeavor. So before I get off the stage, I want to share something with you that I read, and I got about three minutes, so I want to ride through this real quickly. I read this one day. I, was, I want to close here. I was in a mall, and I picked up something, and I saw something that really stood out to me. And it was written by an 85-year-old woman who learned that she was dying. She lived in Kentucky. And the story goes, if I had to do it all over again. And I want you to think about the words that this woman read as you think about empathy. She basically told us that if I had to do it all over again, she said, if I had my life to live all over again, I'd try to make more mistakes the next time. She said, I wouldn't try to be so perfect because we all have perfection fetishes. And what difference does it make if you can let people know you're imperfect? They can then identify with you because no one, despite what they say, can identify with perfection. She said, if I had to live all over again, I'd relax more. I'd be sillier than I've been on this trip. In fact, I know very few things that I would take so seriously. She said, I'd be crazier, I'd be less hygienic, <laughs> and I'd take more chances. I'd climb more mountains, and I'd watch more sunsets. I'd go more places I've never seen. I'd eat more ice cream and fewer beans. She said, I'd, I'd have more actual troubles and fewer imaginary ones. How loud? She said, you see, I was one of those people who lived sensibly and sanely hour after hour, day after day. And she said, oh, I've had my moments, but if I had to do it all over again, I'd have more of those moments. In fact, I'd try to have nothing but beautiful moments, moment by moment by moment, because in case you didn't know it, that's the stuff life is made of, only moments. So she encouraged us all, don't miss the now. She went on to say, my favorite, she says, I've been one of those people who never went anywhere without a thermometer, a hot water bottle, a gargle, a raincoat, and a parachute. And she said, but if I had to do it all over again, I'd travel lighter the next time. If I had to do it all over again, I'd start barefoot earlier in the spring and stay that way until later in the fall. I'd ride more merry-go-rounds, I'd watch more sunrises, and I'd play with more children if I had to do it all over again. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Thank you for allowing me to spend this time with you today. I am so blessed and privileged to share this stage with you all. God bless you. Please live your best life, no regrets, with compassion and empathy for each other. God bless you.